Hi, everybody. Welcome. It's great to see you all and great to have everybody here today. Uh, my name is Caitlin Rivas, and I am a manager here at the Mural Arts Institute at Mural Arts Philadelphia. I am a Black, biracial, multi-ethnic, femme-presenting person, and I'm wearing a pink dress with Black cats and Monstera houseplants on it. Um, I have very curly brown hair, which is pulled into a side ponytail under a pink headband. I am sitting in front of an off-white wall. I also want to let you know that I am zooming in today from the stolen homelands of the Anishinaabe diaspora in the Great Lakes region, and I today am in Detroit. Um, we also want to acknowledge that the land that uh, Philadelphia sits on, where we live and labor, were stolen from the Lenin and Lape peoples and their descendants who survived and remained in the homeland, in addition to those in the diaspora who were forcibly removed as far as Oklahoma, Wisconsin, and Canada, and are still marginalized even in the city of brotherly love. Registration to this symposium was free but please find links to the tribal governments and, and indigenous organizations on Lenape Hanuk land, Philadelphia, in the chat and consider donating and learning more in the spirit of reciprocity and reparations. Um, and now I'm gonna do some introductions to our amazing uh, members of this incredible workshop. So first, I'm gonna start with Chris Rogers. Chris was born and raised in Chester, Pennsylvania and organizes with Police Free Penn. He serves as public programs director at the Paul Robeson House and Museum and sits on the board of the Philadelphia Student Union. He is a graduate student at the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. Jane Robbins Mize is a poet, literary scholar and experimental publisher in Philadelphia. She is also a member of Police Free Pen. Jane Robbins is currently a doctoral candidate in English at the University of Pennsylvania, where she studies the intersections of colonialism, industrialism, and the cultural imagination of water in the early 20th century in the US. She grew up in Athens, Georgia, and received her BA in English and Latin from the University of Texas at Austin. Raka Sen is a graduate student in the sociology program at Penn. Her research interests include the sociology of climate change, social resilience, cities, neighborhoods, and disaster sociology. And she also looks at how everyday adjustments in people's lives are in fact a form of climate change adaption. Raka was awarded the 2019-2020 Fulbright Nehru Research Grant to study how climate change adaptation in the Indian and Bangladeshi Sanbardams in, is fundamentally reshaping the regions. She holds a BA in Sociology, Urban Design, and Architecture Studies from NYU. Emma Glasser is an undergraduate student at UPenn studying material science and engineering and environmental science. She has worked with Apprise Resources for the Future, the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission, and the Socio-Spatial Climate Collaborative. This work has included research on energy affordability, decarbonization technologies and policies, the economic impact of wildfires on water quality, and the Green New Deal. Her passions evolve around climate justice and community organizing, fulfilled through her volunteering with the Sunrise Movement and leadership in the student-led climate justice group, Fossil Free Penn. And finally, Elsa Weiss Potter graduated from UPenn in May 2021 with degrees in physics and political science. She has been involved with climate justice work since 2019 as a coordinator with Fossil Free Pen and has since joined organizations focused on police and prison abolition and Palestinian liberation. She is planning on doing a master's in energy engineering with the emphasis on distributed solar and energy justice. Her research interests include community empowerment based climate adaptation and mitigation. 
Thanks so much for your attention during these introductions. And I would now like to turn it over to Police Free Pen and Fossil Free Pen for our amazing workshop together, Climate and the Carceral State, Imagining an Abolitionist Future. Hi everyone, my name is Shane Robbins and I am a graduate student in English at Penn and also an active member of Police Free Penn. I'm sitting in my bedroom in South Philly. I'm wearing a white shirt. I have long blonde hair and I'm sitting in front of a bookshelf with a viney plant on top. Um, Thanks so much for joining us today for our workshop, Climate and the Carceral State. Oops, I wanted to walk you through a little bit about how today is gonna go and then we'll launch, launch right in. Uh, first, we'll offer some introductions um, about who we are and who our organizations are. We'll introduce Fossil Free Pen and then Police Free Pen. And we'll spend some time talking to you about how the University of Pennsylvania, uh, which we are all affiliated with, how it is complicit in the fossil fuel industry and the prison industrial complex. We'll do a really short breakout room after that for some reflection on what we've said. Then we'll move into a discussion of the intersections of climate, the climate crisis and the carceral state. And these intersections aren't always obvious, so we've tried to kind of tease them out and explain them in a useful way. And then we'll do what we're calling an abolitionist visioning exercise. Uh, will give you guys a chance to imagine alternatives to fossil fuels and to the prison industrial complex and for us to share and brainstorm and dream together for about 30 minutes at the end of, of the event. Uh, so if it, hopefully you, you guys have come kind of brainstorming already what materials you wanna work with, but as we're presenting, you wanna go ahead and gather your colored pencils or a notebook to write in, um, you'll, you'll wanna have that ready to go. Uh, so with no further ado, I'll turn it over to Elsa. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry, my voice is a little bit gone. Um, but yeah, just to briefly describe myself, I am a white woman. Um, I have blonde hair, um, kind of-ish long, uh, brown eyes, and I'm sitting in front of my uh, little bit messy bedroom because I'm moving um, in the next three days. Um, but yeah, so just to briefly um, kind of provide some context for climate justice, um, as we know, any attempt to address the climate emergency that we're currently in must also take into account the interconnected systemic injustices brought about by racial capitalism. Uh, the current environmental reality is not a standalone issue, but is actually a symptom of the power structure and systemic inequality that pervades all aspects of our society, uh, environmental injustice being one of them. The climate justice uh, as, a, as a conceptual basis for working towards climate solutions recognizes that BIPOC communities and poor communities globally are hit the hardest by environmental crises. And as such, only community-based solutions that challenge and democratize the existing power structure will be effective at getting at the root of this issue. And on the slide, we have the sustainable development goals. Um, obviously, the UN still has many issues with it, but this is, um, to some extent, although it doesn't take into consideration the global power dynamic, a useful tool for thinking about the interconnectedness of global injustices and that each of these sustainable development goals um, are interdependent on each other. And um, now I think I'll be passing it off to Emma. Elsa. Yeah. Hi, I'm Emma. Um, to briefly describe myself, I'm a white woman. I have medium long brown hair and brown eyes. I'm wearing a black and brown shirt and I'm sitting in front of a wall with some fake plants hanging behind me. Um, great. So um, to introduce Fossil Free Pen, um, we're a student-led climate justice activist group at the University of Pennsylvania and we are demanding a just democratized university that actively combats systems of destruction for profit, divest from all exploitative sectors and reinvest not in their next extractivist manifestations, but instead in the needs of our communities to build sustainable and just presence and futures. Um, next slide, please. And the reason why we're asking for this is because our university, like many other institutions, has a huge sum of money and they're investing it in Wall Street. These investments have no regard for the people or the planet. Penn's endowment is over $14 billion and it's heavily invested in fossil fuels. 
Meanwhile, our university positions itself as a climate leader through various paltry actions that knowingly fail to address our full environmental impact or the real root of the crisis. So we call these actions what they are, greenwashing. Penn and many other institutions are completely failing to address the system which created the climate crisis or even comment against the fossil fuel industry's atrocities. Next slide, please. So at the same time they're failing to do this, our leadership has extremely conspicuous ties to fossil fuel funders. Our university president, Amy Gutman, is on the board of directors of Vanguard, which holds the largest portfolio of fossil fuel stocks. And we have numerous trustees in powerful leadership positions at banks, insurance companies, and asset managers from Blackstone to Wells Fargo and JP Morgan Chase, who are all profiting from fossil fuel investments as well as funding fossil fuel projects. The people who run our institution are profiting off of fossil fuels. And so it's not a big surprise that our university itself is profiting off the same destruction. Ultimately, our university needs to put their money where their mouth is. The fossil fuel industry has five times the amount of oil and gas in the reserves than that is safe to burn for a world that does not increase beyond two degrees Celsius. In extracting fossil fuels, the industry devastates communities and then they build pipelines to transport these fuels through indigenous land, violating indigenous rights, as well as setting up construction man camps, which are disproportionately responsible for the high rates of murdered and missing indigenous women and children. The fossil fuel industry then places power plants to burn their fuels in black, brown and indigenous communities who suffer from high levels of air pollution and associated health impacts, including asthma and rare cancers. Next slide, please. So the fact that our institution, my institution that I go to is complicit in these vile acts is atrocious. And this is what we as a group are fighting against. We have five demands to change the way that Penn engages with the community and the world. We want them to divest from fossil fuels and all other destruction for profit. So what this means is we want them to take their money out of these companies. We want them to cut all the ties that they have with the fossil fuel industry, its financers and its upholders. We want them to repair the damage from their complicity in environmental racism and reinvest in a sustainable, just future for Philadelphia. So the idea is we want them to invest so that Philadelphia has a chance to have a livable future, not wrecked by climate catastrophe, eco-apartheid, deadly policing, or mass incarceration. And lastly, we want this university to democratize its power structure to include Philly residents and the Penn community in their decision-making to avoid these problems happening from the start. So now I'm going to pass it on to Chris to introduce Police Free Pen. Thank you, um, Emma. Um, I'm Chris Rogers. I'm from Chester, Pennsylvania. I take he, him pronouns. Um, I'm a black male in my 30s, um, sitting in my home office. Uh, right behind me, you'll see me trying to sneak in my great Free Mumia um, poster. Um, and also some words from Eduardo Galliano up on the wall. And I'm wearing a blue, a light blue turquoise cops off campus hoodie because it is abolition May. Um, so um, Police Free Penn uh, is a collective of Penn affiliated activists that was created in June of, this, of 2020. We are an abolitionist organization and we follow in the footsteps of longstanding organizations such as critical resistance which defines abolition as a political vision with the goal of eliminating imprisonment, policing and surveillance and creating lasting alternatives to punishment and imprisonment. Our goal at PFP is to abolish Penn's ties to the prison industrial complex and to transform community safe, safety within and beyond the institution. You can go to the next slide, next slide, please. All right. Many people don't know this, but the uh, University of Pennsylvania holds the largest private police force in the state of Pennsylvania um, and the third largest in the country. Um, this was, we found this out because it's proudly displayed on the University of Pennsylvania Department of Campus Safety website. Um, 
Penn Police has a history of targeting faculty, staff, and students of color on campus, as well as residents of West Philadelphia. And I think it's an important distinction that we lift up that this is not just about the mistreatment by police or police brutality, or, or um, but rather that the function of policing continues the uh, dispossession and displacement of West Philadelphia's you know, communities of color um, and those who uh, are living in poverty. So Penn's, uh, one of the, we sort of came together in the wake of Penn's policing tactics on full display on May 31st of 2020, when the community, uh, uh, the neighborhood, the black, mostly black neighborhood around 52nd Street uh, was being assaulted with tear gas and chemical weapons. Um, this of you know event really uh, spurred us into action to think about the relationships that not only Penn Police has to the community, but also what Penn researchers have done and continue to do in in the uh, so in the wake of their research. So we're thinking about their long-standing contracts with corporations like Aramark and the Compass Group both of which profit off the prison industrial complex as food vendors. It also financially supports harmful racist research like that of Richard Burke, um, who has uh, been a leader in sort of defining risk algorithms that are based on racist data that determine who's let out of cages, um, which we might call prisons and who's not. Finally, Penn is tied to the Crossroads State through its board of trustees, who individually profit off the expansion of the prison, prison industry in ICE. And many of you might be familiar with some of our recent collaborations, uh, with the work of Abdul Ali Muhammad and finding out that you know, Penn, Penn's museum uh, as, as a place that puts on display sort of like the cap, captive trophies of colonial exploitation, both you know, with, you know, as we can see with Black communities here, such as the MOVE organization, but also indigenous communities here uh, that are here. And then you can think about much of their collection that has come from the mainland, uh, from, the, from the motherland for me, the African continent. So we continue to make those connections of how that is also part of um, a racial capitalist system um, that furthers you know, displacement. And let me get to the demands just to make sure we still on top. So our six demands, right? Uh, decriminalize blackness, protest, and poverty. Divest from the prison industrial complex. To defund the University of Pennsylvania Police Department. To disband the University of Pennsylvania Police Department by 2025. And these demands are in relationship to the Black Philly Radical Collective's 13 demands that were set forth by longstanding Black led abolitionist organizations in the city of Philadelphia. So we do this work in coordination and, and in um, inspiration by with the demands that they have led. Uh, number five, reinvest the community control funds in West Philadelphia and beyond. Six, redress the legacy of racism, colonialism, and slavery on campus. And seven, reimagine police-free strategies for community safety and well-being, especially for the Black, Indigenous, POC, and LGBTQIA communities. So this includes, yes, paying pilots. Um, Penn should be paying pilots. And also, as we see, the abolition of the Morton Collection at Penn Museum um, also fits into this rubric. And we have many more, and I'll post that link into the chat. But and that's pretty much an introduction of PFP, and I'll pass it back to my comrade, Jane, to keep us moving. Thanks so much, everybody. Um for introducing FFP and PFP. Uh, so we've talked a lot about how the University of Pennsylvania is complicit in the fossil fuel industry and the prison industrial complex. But I know that many of you are not a part of the quote unquote Penn community. Uh, and, or maybe you don't live in Philadelphia or maybe you live in a different part of Philly. And um, we'd love to give you guys a chance to kind of reflect on what we've just told you about and maybe to reflect on the organizations and institutions that you're a part of in your life, maybe the place you work for or um, the school you attended or the school you're currently attending. Um, and to, yeah, to just like have a moment to check in with each other and have a, a bit of reflection. So just five minutes, um, breakout rooms to, to talk together and we'll come right back.
thanks so much everyone for checking in with one another. Uh, people are gonna be trickling back into the main room, but I think we'll go ahead and shift over uh, to our next part of the presentation and I'll send it over to Emma. Thanks, Jane. Um, can everybody see and hear me well? Okay, great. Um, yeah, thank you guys for talking in your breakout rooms. Definitely keep thinking about this question. Um, you'll have time to talk about it later if there were some unanswered questions. Um, but now we're going to start talking about a few intersections that we see between the fossil fuel industry and the carceral state. And the first one that I'm going to talk about is exchange. So there is a direct exchange between fossil fuel interests and the carceral state. Fossil fuel powers provide carceral power with money and in return, carceral power gives fossil fuel power protection. We know that there is a huge imperative to stop fossil fuel expansion right now as we actually need to dramatically decrease our fossil fuel use. Crucial resistance to the fossil fuel industry looks like indigenous led blocking of pipeline construction, shutting down refineries, mobilizing coal towns against mountaintop removal mining and intervening in global climate talks. And what we're seeing is increasingly militarized police responses. Security at fossil fuel sites in the US has become increasingly militarized following the 2016 protests to stop construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline under which was built under a sacred indigenous water source on the Standing Rock Indian Reservation in South Dakota. The Dakota Access Pipeline is built on Lakota and Dakota land and it in fact breaks the 1851 Fort Laramie Treaty which established the land as belonging to the Sioux. In response to the indigenous led mass mobilization of water protectors, there was military style counterterrorism measures and police collaboration. Energy Transfer Partners, which is the energy company behind the pipeline, they hired a private security firm, which coordinated its efforts with local, state, and federal law enforcement to undermine the protest movement and paint water protectors as dangerous when in fact they were incredibly peaceful. Um, the police beat water protectors, they used tear gas, water cannons, rubber bullets, and LRAD sound devices, as well as the private security guards actually attacked peaceful protesters with dogs. Um, there were more than 800 people arrested with indigenous folks facing the harshest charges and sentencing. And this photo on the right of the screen is actually from October 27, 2016, as law enfor enforcement officers moved to clear the 1851 treaty camp. This picture is at County Road 134, where a group of water protectors set a barricade on fire to prevent the police from encroaching on their land before retreating. And in response to this incredibly powerful resistance, the fossil fuel industry is lobbying to limit the right to protest as well as criminalize trespassing on energy plants and pipelines, making such actions felonies. And they have 84 Congress members behind them, including four Democrats who sent a letter urging the Attorney General to charge anti-pipeline protesters with terrorism under the Patriot Act. The FBI also has been known to surveil pipeline protesters as they did with Keystone XL protesters from 2014 or 2012 to 2014, as well as in 2016, the FBI opened a terrorism investigation of these standing rock water protectors. Another fight I want to bring forward is line three. It's another pipeline and it's being built right now. It's aiming to be finished by the end of the summer. It's being built in so-called Minnesota. It crosses Anishinaabe treaty lands and it violates indigenous rights to free and prior informed consent. It also violates local Ojibwe tribes treaty that protects the rights to hunt, fish, gather medicinal plants and wild rice and preserve sacred and culturally important sites. So indigenous led resistance has been met with lots of water protectors getting arrested and police following and intimidating them both verbally and physically. And the oil giant behind the pipeline, Enbridge, they set up a special fund that is reimbursing police responses to anything pipeline related. This means that anytime the police act against these water protectors, whether they are surveilling them, suppressing them, following them, pulling them over, arresting them or jailing them, they're billing this energy company Enbridge for it. 
Right now, there are actually calls to join these water protectors on the front lines. So if you're interested in going to line three, there's a mass mobilization happening June 5th to 8th called the Treaty People Gathering. There's a goal of getting 500 to 1,000 people to show up. Um, but if you can't make that, there have been and will continue to be resistance, including direct actions on the front lines, as well as online organizing and actions in your local community um, this entire summer. And I will send you the information for the treaty people gathering in the Zoom chat right now, or actually I'll do it after I finish speaking. Um, so as you see, there is a direct exchange between fossil fuel interests and the carceral state. Fossil fuel power provides money to police departments and in exchange, they get protection of their fossil fuel projects. So Little Sis, which is a grassroots watchdog watchdog network, they actually were able to expose many of these companies from oil companies, Chevron and Shell, you can see um, the their logos are up here, Marathon Oil 2, then there's Valero and Hillcorp, which are other energy companies, and then there's fossil fuel funders, JP Morgan Chase and Goldman Sachs. Little Sis was actually able to expose all of these groups for donating substantially to police departments in different cities. And it's actually quite clear, I hope from my examples, why these fossil fuel corporations and investors and funders have a vested interest in the carceral state. The police and the prison system protect their ability to extract and destroy land and livelihoods for profit by criminalizing the very resistance protecting all that is sacred. So that's our first intersection exchange and I now will pass it on to Jane to talk about our next intersection. Thanks Emma. Uh, second intersection between the climate catastrophe and the carceral state is financial investment um, beginning with the federal government in the, in the United States case. Data from 2017, as an example, shows that the United States spent $115 billion on policing in one year alone. And that same year spent only $8 billion on the Environmental Protection Agency and only $7 billion on Federal Emergency Management Agency. Uh, that's, I created this bar graph. I think it's pretty powerful as a visualization of the $100 billion difference between financial investments in policing and the EPA and FEMA. Also, as you might've read in recent decades, the Pentagon has transferred over $5 billion in surplus military equipment to community police forces. So community policing is becoming closer and closer to a militarized police force uh, because of government investment. So the US is, government is demonstrating time and again through both spending and property investments that its priorities lie in policing communities rather than in protecting them from the environmental crisis and also rather than reinvesting in community controlled funds, in education, in infrastructure, in jobs, in sustainable agriculture, things that would really keep the community safe. Uh, it's instead pouring into uh, militarized policing. Uh, I'd also like to note that harmful investments also occur at state and local levels. Uh, simply put, governments police more and invest less in communities of color, which leads to higher rates of incarceration and lower air and water quality in these same neighborhoods. Governments also give polluting corporations massive tax breaks. The image on the right in this slide is of the PES oil refinery in South Philadelphia which was responsible for many years for over 50% of toxic air emissions in the city, even while it was receiving massive corporate tax breaks from the government. The refinery was causing extremely high asthma rates for children in South Philly, uh, two to three times higher than the national average, uh, in spite of organizers continually calling for it to be shut down. It is now shut down. That's only after it exploded in 2019 and organizers from a group called Philly Thrive who are seen protesting here, they succeeded in demanding that the city shut it down for good. And now we're demanding that the city reinvest those funds that it gained through PES into the community. Um, and then finally, financial investments of private companies also contribute to climate and racial injustices. 
banks have been proven to invest less in communities of color and in businesses owned by people of color, um, which increases wealth disparities between white and black neighborhoods. And corporations pollute more in communities of color, uh, just as a fact. So I, I really want to emphasize that last point that corporations and especially fossil fuel corporations pollute more and release more toxins into the air and water if their factories and refineries are located in neighborhoods made up mostly by people of color. This is because regulations are more likely to be looser in communities of color due to racial discrimination by state and local governments, and also because corporations discriminate against people of color when making business decisions. So I just wanna say that you know, racism plays out at the level of investing um, as much, if not more than through the practices of policing and polluting alone. Oh, and I'll pass it over to Raka. I wasn't sure. Um, hi, I'm Raka Sen. Um, I am in West Philadelphia in my apartment. Um, I'm wearing a black t-shirt that says abolish police, but the ICE is a different color because we also want to abolish ICE. Um, I have a huge monstera behind me. And I think that's all I'll say just for time. Um, but so the next intersection that I'm going to talk about is migration and borders. So a huge intersection between climate and the carceral state that we saw is between within both international and intranational migration stories. So for example, people often migrate for climate re related reasons and then um, are detained by ICE and detention centers for indefinite periods of time. So immigration, as we know in the US context is a huge, huge issue. So for scale, in the last 200 years, the US has deported more than 57 million people, which is more than any other country in the world. And during the last century, federal officials have actually deported more people than they have allowed to remain in the US on a permanent basis, which is a fact that really challenges this notion of the like quote unquote land of opportunity that we say the US is. Um, and nine out of 10 of these deportations are for people from Latin America and primarily from Mexico, which I point out for a reason, so bear with me. And all of these stats are from a really good book that I love and I'll put the um, link in the chat when I'm done. Um, and then for migration on a global scale, especially thinking about climate migration, in 2019, nearly 2000 disasters triggered almost 25 million internal displacements, which is three, time the num three times the number of displacements caused by conflict and violence the same year. And most of these disaster displacements were the result of tropical storms and monsoon rains, things like that. And they were in Southeast Asia uh, um, and the Pacific. And four countries actually accounted for more than 17 million of the 25 million internal displacements due to disasters that year. And those countries were India, the Philippines, Bangladesh, and China. Um, in the first half of 2020, we see these trends continue. The disasters, disasters displaced almost 10 million people and remain the like leading trigger of internal displacements globally. So what do all those statistics tell us? What we're seeing here, in my opinion, is a trend. There are deep divides between the countries like the US and Europe, which wasn't on any of those lists, um, who are the main consumers of fossil fuels and goods created by fossil fuels, and the, contributes, the countries that contribute the least to climate change, but are really feeling the brunt of its effects. So it's estimated that Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Asia Southeast Asia specifically, will generate 143 million more internally displaced climate migrants by 2050. And that brings us to the question of like, where will they want to go? Which countries will let them in? And it creates this like system of like eco-apartheid, which I'm gonna talk about on the next slide. Um, and it becomes a really huge looming question for the future. But before we get there, Elsa's gonna talk a little bit about one specific case study of this right now. Right, thanks Raka. Um, so another example of kind of the arbitrary borders that um, Raka just discussed on the southern border of the US or Turtle Island um, is uh, what's happening in Gaza. Um, so as we've seen in the past week, 200 Palestinians have died from Israeli airstrikes, including 59 children. Many refer to Gaza as an open air prison as the small strip of land has been under siege by land and sea since 2007 when Hamas won the elections um, in Gaza and the West Bank um, and uh, actually was able to maintain control 
control over Gaza, although not the West Bank. So 2 million Palestinians, many of them descendants from refugees, um, uh, descendants of refugees from 1948 are trapped in Gaza, unable to leave, um, unable to even really fish outside of a very limited um, area into the sea, into the Mediterranean, um, and they're subject to Israeli military campaigns. Um, but although this is oftentimes what we think of um, what's happening in Gaza, and obviously it's very relevant to what's going on right now, um, these two million Palestinians are also subject to environmental racism, and environmental um, injustice. So. Uh, the um, environment is actually used here as a tool to further tighten the hold um, on Gaza by Israel. And we see that especially in the sanitation crisis that's been noted many times by um, Amnesty International, by Human Rights Watch, and by the UN. But right now, less than 5% of water in Gaza is drinkable, um, due in part to the fact that the two wastewater facilities um, in Gaza were bombed and are unable to be rebuilt. Um, due to the siege, which actually focuses also on construction materials. And additionally, intense water pollution from Israeli agriculture on the other side of the border um, increases the, uh, the lack of potable water uh, in Gaza. Um, and in fact, this, this uh, water pollution has actually started to affect Israelis in southern Israel, um, which did catch the attention of the Israeli government, but not in an inclusive uh, way of actually addressing the ecosystem as a whole, but only in terms of the security threat that that poses to Israelis. Um, so this example is just a reminder that borders themselves can be used to both incarcerate people in poverty as well as facilitate environmental destruction um, as these arbitrary borders are used to divide up which environments will be protected and which will be actively destroyed, which obscures the true reality that the ecosystem um, on both sides is actually are, is interconnected. And I'll just give it back to Raka. Thanks, Elsa. Um, okay, so while we oftentimes talk about Gaza as effectively being an open air prison because people can't leave, um, we're now going to look more to places where people are allowed out and there are these different mechanisms of control that we see as like jails, detention centers, among other, other things. As um, Jane noted, BIPOC communities in the US are disproportionately policed and polluted um, and there's less investment in them and jails and detention centers are often like placed at in frontline communities facing environmental injustice. And then they're also used incarcerated and detained people as labor. So it's like a double whammy. Um, and they're also, because they're also used as economic opportunities in this region where there aren't too many other options for stable employment. So I bring this up because I think it's a point where we can really begin to imagine how non-carceral state opportunities might become mutually, mutually or triply beneficial in these communities. So, um, the cumulative effects of culturally ingrained racial prejudice and systemic privilege during the climate emergency is often referred to as eco-apartheid. I really prefer this concept of eco-apartheid to concepts like environmental racism because I think it better in, um, encompasses the interlinked process of inequality beyond race to include things like space, place, water. And I also think that it's very helpful because even the words eco apartheid make it clear that racial justice and climate justice are inextricably linked or are arguably even the same thing because of the way that they have been layered historically. Um, my favorite de definition of eco apartheid comes from Professor Antwi Ekom, who says that eco apartheid is one environmental bad such as um, pollution and toxicity are in low income communities of color, while environmental goods, such as whole foods, open spaces and parks are in healthier, wider communities. Two, going beyond race and space, re race to space, place and water means that we can also consider things like the urban grocery gap, gap in access to healthy foods and the transportation gap in our definitions of eco apartheid. And finally, eco-apartheid captures the political, historical, and spatial dimensions to the reproduction of inequality. Um, so incarcerated BIPOC communities are forced to handle the increased ecological harms, but they can't even um, voluntarily access these same jobs for fair pay post-incarceration. So a case study that um, really makes this clear is the California wildfires. Pre-COVID, incarcerated people were paid a dollar an hour to contain the fires, clear brush, and do other dangerous labor. And during COVID, much of the, um, the incarcerated po population in California has been released early, which is great, but those, and those who have not been released are at a much higher risk of contracting COVID. But like that, the people who have been released and the people who 
are exposed to COVID together create like a labor shortage within the prisons for like, which has called a lot of attention to the state's reliance on prison labor to fight fires and is a longstanding and to a longstanding critique of the program because it's so hard for the same people to become professional firefighters for a fair pay once they're free. Um, for more on this, I'll actually drop another link in the chat for this article I really like by Diva Pager, a sociologist at Harvard called The Mark of a Criminal Record, which shows that it's easier for um, a white man with a criminal record to get a job than a black man without one. And she does like an experimental study um, because then if you start to think about what the actual implications of the mark of the criminal record are, it's really profound. Um, and prison labor in our, um, prison labor we find is like very akin to slave labor, which is like all of those things are really rooted in like capitalism, which Elsa is gonna talk about next. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting myself. Um, right, so each of the intersections that we've outlined above um, are a manifestation of consumer capitalist values if we understand them to be consumption, profit maximization, and incessant growth. Uh, these values are what motivate the existence of exploitive, exploitative and extractive structures. A continuous exploitation is actually central to capitalism if we understand it to, uh, to really focus on those values that I mentioned previously. So systems including the carceral state and politically powerful industries like the like fossil fuel industry are put in place to ensure an endless supply of resources and labor. One of these resources is uh, what I like to refer to as wastelands. So it's similar to colonized land that was used to extract usable resources, the notion of wastelands are dispensable lands in which uh, the consequences of building fossil fuels or building fossil fuel pipelines um, like the line three on indigenous land um, or the health of, of South Philadelphia residents living in the vicinity of a refinery or the runoff of agricultural pollution to Gaza um, is not really prioritized. So the environmental protection of these regions is considered unimportant because the people that inhabit it are valued less than the protecting the profit margins of the polluters. The military, police, and prison industrial complexes, and the fossil fuel industry, which is the number one contributor to climate change, then continue to protect and support each other as they are systems that ultimately serve the same individuals that benefit from the entire capitalist economic structure. Uh, with each new intersection, the values of capitalism only become further entrenched, um, and it is a self-perpetuating network of systems. Uh, so, this is kind of a, a broad overview of um, how we see that capitalism really is very pervasive and kind of uh, impacts each of the inter intersections that um, Emma, Raka, and Jane discussed previously. Um, but although it is true that with each new intersection, they become, uh, they, they further um, reinforce and support each other. Um, in the intersections, there's also real strength for solidarity. So we've talked about indigenous resistance, Palestinian resistance, abolitionist resistance, um, and environmental justice. And each of these are only furthered by seeing the connection with the other um, resistance movements. Um, so that's also where by having conferences like this um, and by really working with each other and and not kind of allowing ourselves to be siloed in uh, our in our campaigns, it actually allows us to um, to see these intersections and then to some extent also exploit them to to note that we are actually uh, working towards one larger future and that we can't really have climate justice without also having racial justice without also freeing Palestine without also working towards decolonization on a global scale. Um, so I think with that in mind, uh, we're going to be moving on to our creative exercise. Thanks, everyone. Um, so we've thrown a lot at you in terms of facts and numbers and statistics. And we've shared a bunch of our research about how the fossil fuel industry and the prison industrial complex are, are intertwined. And it can really start to feel like an impossible challenge, like Elsa's pointed out. So we want to spend the rest of this session thinking about alternatives, alternatives to police and prisons and fossil fuels, because fighting for alternatives just requires radical acts of imagination. And we want to practice that. We want to practice envisioning a just and sustainable future together. 
So we're gonna do what we're calling a visioning exercise. And we'd like each of you to use whatever medium you'd like um, to help us imagine this future. We're gonna post a, some ideas for different quote unquote mediums in the chat, um, but whatever you feel most comfortable working in, maybe it's drawing, maybe it's um, writing a paragraph or a poem or designing a graphic. Um, and we also think it might help to focus on a particular aspect of your community in order to spark imagination because we know that restriction often helps us think bigger. So we're going to invite you to join uh, five different breakout rooms um, on different parts of our communities. The first will be public safety and I'll be in that break breakout room. The second will be education and Chris will be leading that one. The third will be public health. And we're thinking of that as encompassing clean air and water, access to food, mental health care, equitable health care, things like that. And that will be led by Emma. Um, then we'll have a room on, on governance broadly, thinking about decolonization, land back movements, borders and migration, nationalism and nationalities, as well as community accountability. And if none of these rooms are really speaking to you uh, or you have something else in mind, we'll have a fifth room uh, that will be led by Raka for, for the miscellaneous group. So we posted that in the chat. Um, you'll be invited to choose your room in, in just a moment. Uh, but before we do that, just some questions that you might wanna ask yourself just to get you going are basically things like, what would a police-free sustainable school look like? What would need to change for that to be viable? Or how would the parks in your neighborhood be changed without policing? Or if there weren't roads with cars driving on them, crossing right through the parks? Um, it might also be helpful to think about how police and prisons and fossil fuels do affect your community, um, as we did a little bit at the beginning, and then to imagine how that could be changed. I'll also say this is a super challenging exercise, and it's something that like we as abolitionists do actively as an ongoing part of our organizing. It's really difficult to imagine how we would keep each other safe without police. And it's difficult to imagine how our lives would continue a pace without gas burning cars and planes. So you can use this opportunity to work through questions you have about the way that the world operates today. So one question that I often ask is what could the government invest in that would lead to a more just and sustainable society? Um, but maybe you have questions that you're particularly passionate about similarly. And just Lastly, remember that there are no right answers. We are all working to imagine an alternative to this, this uh, capitalist racist society we live in. So we only hope that you push yourself to break out of the status quo and to, to really dream about a radical revolutionary world. So what's gonna happen next is you'll receive a pop-up window inviting you to join a breakout room, choose whichever one is interested to you. And once you join that room, we'd like you to turn away from Zoom for about 15 minutes and spend some time imagining and working uh, creatively. And then after 15 minutes, you'll join, you'll rejoin the folks in your breakout room and you'll have a chance to share your ideas with one another for about 10 minutes or so. Uh, and then we'll come back into the, to the main room to close out. And we will be stopping the recording at this point. So don't feel self-conscious about making funny faces on while you're making art or um, 